Nirva La Fortune. Nirva um, is a Providence City Council member representing Ward 3 and Vice Chair of the Education Committee. Councilwoman La Fortune is the manager and advisor of the Presidential Scholars Program and a first year <laughs> advisor in the Dean of College at Brown University. She is responsible for the coordination and planning of programs in the Department of Corrections to support students from historically underrepresented groups. In the DOC is not the no. department. What does no. DOC stand for? <laughs> dean of College. In the Dean of College, I'm sorry. I was like, wow, that's in that's impressive. But I was like, I don't think I don't think they have. Okay. <laughs> um, so she supports students from underrepresented groups and students with great financial need. Um, an avid reader, marathoner, and has embarked a 50 state challenge with her son and daughter and hopes to visit all seven continents. That's a very beautiful bio. Thank you, Mirva. Thank you. The most important thing that was enlisted is that I am an immigrant. I was also once undocumented, and I, I was separated from my family. And so one of the things that I'm noticing today is that we have evolved. Many, many, many years ago, I'm not going to say how many years because I would give up my age, my parents didn't have this um, support. There was no one there to hear their cries. There was no one there to hear their prayers while I was back in Haiti and they were here in America. And I was in Haiti during the um, Duvalier era. So my family, my, my parents had friends who were persecuted. Um, my um, my um, maternal grandfather was actually murdered um, by um, bandits. Um, and some say they were part of Toto Makuts. And so immigration affects many people from many backgrounds. Some are Spanish-speaking folks, some are French, Creole-speaking folks, some people come from countries where they speak um, native indigenous languages. But it um, impacts so many people. And to see so many of you here today, to, to, to call out our government. And it's interesting, what I've heard also is that um, they're monsters. For the past two months, I've been trying to figure out which monster I can describe the uh, president to be and members of his administration. And the reality is, is that many of those monsters have empathy. They have compassion. And this person lacks empathy and compassion. When I talk about this, it triggers me. Because I understand the impact that separation has on children. When I came to this country, my mother left when I was an infant, so I didn't know my mom. They wouldn't give me a visa, despite that I was a baby. And so when I came to this country, I didn't even know who my mother was. I still remember someone, and I remembered my dad because he left after, but I still remember when I first came to Rhode Island, when, I, when the person who brought me over, um, who risked her life, to bring me to this country because I actually came here on someone else's birth certificate. And so when she, when she brought me to my parents' house, we were living on Dartmouth Avenue on the south side, um, I still remember, or was it Dexter's, either Dar Dartmouth or Dexter, and I still remember this woman coming up to me and she thought that I would recognize my mom, so jokingly she said, I'm your mom. And I was like, hello, in French. I was like, oh, salut, comment vas-tu? And you know, everyone was like, that's not your mom but I couldn't remember my mother. And what else is happening is that these kids who are already vulnerable, they're putting them in sometimes dangerous circumstances. These kids are being exposed to people that they don't know. I've heard stories where children are being sexually assaulted. And we've seen images of kids being put in cages as if they're animals. And a couple of people have said it, is that racism is deeply rooted in our history. Because I've also heard that, oh, this is new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not new. Mm -hmm. Separation of families started during slavery. 
It started during the American Japanese concentration camps. When indigenous populations, when they would take their kids to colonize their kids' minds and whitewash their minds, so they would send them to those special schools. It started way before now, and unfortunately, there are many people who believe that if you're an immigrant, you don't belong. And the reality is, is that immigrants built this country. And the country that this, they built was, again, not their country to begin with. And so, and, and slaves, enslaved, the enslaved also built this country. So as we advocate against this, we also need to be reminded that this is nothing new. Until we change the DNA of our country, this will continue. In the past, it was black African Americans, it was Native Americans, it was Japanese, and today it's immigrants. Tomorrow it will be someone else. We have to stop this. Too many families are being affected. Too many people believe that they are more superior than others. And the reality is, it's because they're doing this out of fear. They don't know. Immigrants are your neighbors. There's a family right in my ward who's struggling with this issue right now. And it's not just happening at the border. It's happening right here in Providence. It's happening in New York. It's happening in Boston. It's happening in Miami. It's happening in Michigan. It's happening in California. It's happening everywhere. Someone in my ward, her husband, who's been active in her child's school, who picks their ch children up every day, who takes them to their doctor's appointments, who cooks their meals, was, 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 was um, taken into custody. <coughs> and this person doesn't have the financial resources or the knowledge to understand the whole process and she's trying to figure things out. They just, they just closed on a house. So this month, they were supposed to be moving into their new home. And they can't do that right now. Or she'll have to do it on her own. So we need to change that. We need to change the DNA of our country. And I'm so happy to see all of you here. But we need to change the makeup of Washington, D.C. We need to elect more people of color. We need to elect more women. We need to elect people and immigrants who understand what it means to be separated from their families, who understands what it means to be marginalized. Because no one can tell my story, because only I know my story. Only I know. Only the children who are separated from their families know their story. Only the mothers who cry, who say that they would rather die than be separated from their children, know that narrative. So it's not up to us to, to, to speak that narrative, but to make sure that we provide a space for those individuals to share their story. And so what I'm gonna ask all of you today to do is when you go home, get to know your neighbor. Because we're, we're, we're advocating for what's happening at the border, and we should, and we need to continue to do that. But you need to find out what's happening in your communities. You need to figure out how many people who live on your block are immigrants, or how many people that went to school with your children face this issue. Because that advocacy has to start here. We cannot force DC or advocate for members of Congress or the Senate or our president to do anything if we're not supporting people here in our community, if we're not pushing our representatives here in our community, if, we're not, if, we, if we don't even know who our neighbors are. So when you leave here today, figure out who's your neighbor. Figure out how you can support someone who's facing this issue right here in Rhode Island or next door in Boston or Connecticut. Because it has to start here in our own backyard 
before we can address the issues outside of our community. Thank you.